Good afternoon and welcome to Los Angeles, the other side of the world. We uh, flew here with our bikes. Belen is behind the camera again. And before we go and ride the Baja Divide in Mexico, we thought today would be the perfect chance to start something that I've been anticipating for 2023, which is a series of inspiring riders, other bikepackers with interesting stories to tell and just giving them a platform to talk uh, through an interview style kind of video, much like we did with the factory tour back in Germany. So here we are in Los Angeles and our first guest today for the Rider Saddle series is Eric Sedeno, or the Bicycle Nomad, as he calls himself. He's done some incredible things and uh, we're gonna unpack that in a little interview here. Nice cafe in Los Angeles, sunny weather, let's go. My mom would say, regardless of, of your skin color, regardless of how you speak or how you look, you could do anything you want. And she told me that from like two years old, three years old, four years old, all the way up to she passed away, told me that. And I, till this day, believe that. It's such a pleasure to meet you here in LA. I'm, Thank I'm you. so happy that we have the chance to see yes. you and to speak with you about uh, your life, your fascinating projects, everything you do on the bike and off the bike. So I guess uh, to just jump into this, maybe you can run us through a little introduction of yourself, who you are, where you grew up, uh, what life has been in the U.S., what life in the U.S. has been like for you, and uh, yeah, all the like, little introduction to your projects. Yeah. So uh, my name is Eric Cedeno. On social media, people know me as the Bicycle Nomad. Um, when I grew up, I grew up, I was born in Panama, Panama City, Panama, in Central America. And when I was 15 years old, I moved to Miami. But I always analyze my life and faces of my life. And I feel like the reason I am who I am today is because of the family, my mom and my dad, especially my mom. My mom knew at an early age that I was a very curious kind of guy and allowed me to be who I am today. Um, Meaning when I was a kid, when I was five, six, seven years old, I would love to go outdoors and explore and, and go on hikes at an early age. And she allowed me to go that and never limited me and actually encouraged me. Like, she's like, okay, well, let, make sure that you have sandwiches and things like that. And, and I love that. I love that she didn't limit me, you know? And when I was a kid, I have a couple of instances where that I remember. Uh, one of them being, uh, I was like eight, nine years old, and every Friday, my mom would take me to McDonald's. Me and my brother, or maybe just by myself, but every Friday, it was like our tradition. Yeah. We go to McDonald's, have a happy meal, and uh, we would walk back. My mom never drove, she hated driving. Yeah. Um, so she went public transportation everywhere. And I was nine, nine, nine years old and it was about five o'clock in the afternoon. My mom was coming home from, from work in a bus and looked outside the window of the bus and said, oh my God, that's my son. And she said, please stop the bus. And she walked outside and said, Eric, and never screamed at me. She wanted to know what was in my head all the time. And she said, Eric, where are you going? <laughs> Why are you way out here? I literally was about four miles from home, um, about a mile and a half away from McDonald's. Yeah. And I said, I have always go to McDonald's with you and I never know what's past McDonald's. So I just wanted to see what was past McDonald's. Wow. And uh, she laughed and we got in the bus and left. Yeah. And I, I'm still that kid, you know, I, I, I hate McDonald's now, but, um, but I, I've always been curious. And I just love that I had my mom who allowed me to just be curious and never limit me. Yeah. And when I was 12 years old, she, um, we went to Mexico to see the pyramids of the Mayan and Aztec civilization pyramids and temples of the, of the ancient civilization. Just that. She hired a tour guide and they, we climbed, I was 12 years old, I was climbing pyramids, going into temples, and that just changed my life. And that's one of the reasons why 
today I love history and I love traveling and exploring, you know. Which is what a lot of your projects now are based upon, no? Yes, my, my projects are based, I love traveling by bike and I did a few trips without going through history and I realized that I enjoy better when I'm able to interwine bike packing, traveling by bike and history. Yeah, to understand where you are, what has happened in that place. Yeah, to understand, to understand history, to understand what happened to those people, to understand, uh, to be in, to engage myself in the landscape yeah. of of this geography of this country. You know, which is is amazing. Belen and I have done several rides in Europe, and uh, rides that go through the Alps are always really interesting, because with the First World War, a lot played out there, and riding you know routes like the Asiago loop the bike ring route in Italy just being on that plateau this little part of the foothills uh, Italian foothills of the Alps is so so incredibly enriching history wise because so much happened you don't see any of it you just see rock and some leftovers of maybe the trenches or um, you know the encampments and having a, an eye for that realizing that those things happened you can start finding out, but you have to realize, of course, and you have to savor an interest for it. And I really like that your um, twist to your project and to your, your bikepacking rides is history and that you try to unveil something that happened on a particular route or something that happened to a particular person or group of people along the way. But maybe we should backtrack it a yeah. little to the bike because I'm just curious when you found the bicycle. You were telling me the story of you being a child and I'm just wondering did you already cycle at that point or did you find the bike um, further in, in your process of growing up and becoming who you are today? Yeah I found the bike and the freedom that the bike gave me early on. I was a, I was a kid, I was uh, five six years old and my mom gave me a bike and, and my dad taught me how to ride the bike and and when I said the freedom is like what it gives to all, every kid, right? Like I was able now to go to the swimming pool at seven, eight years old and I was uh, a swimmer growing up. I was in a team, but I didn't have to depend on my father or my mom to take me to the pool and I could go now whenever I want to. Um, I could go visit my uncles, my aunts, my cousins because now I have a bike that took me to those places. Yeah. So that sense of freedom that all the kids have, um, I got it early on when I was five, six years old. But I, as an adult, uh, became interested on what the bike was and what it provided me because I was, I graduated college and my first job was working in Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and I was trying to figure out how do I travel with what I was making uh, on my first job coming out of college and I knew that I had to pay rent and that I had to eat uh, but I was like where can I save money and at that point in Philadelphia and still today the streets are very narrow and you have to move your vehicles to because they have to plow the street or clean the streets so your uh, different days you have to move your vehicle and and I was not aware of that because we didn't have that in Miami and I will get tickets uh, traffic not parking tickets yeah parking tickets yeah. I will get parking tickets from the city and I'm like oh man this is driving me insane wow. and I remember my dad saying that he was looking for a car for his wife and uh, I was like, oh, I'll give you my car, you know, like I want to get rid of this. And I worked and lived downtown. Uh, not, I worked downtown and I didn't live that far from downtown that I'm like, I'll just commute by bike. Yeah. And I, I started like using public transportation like their, uh, which is amazing and, and their train system. But by bike is how I commuted. You're so yeah. free on, on two wheels. In, yeah. in a city like that though, I, I would immediately ask uh, myself, if it's wise to go out on a bike because for us you know Berlin and, and me coming from Europe US cities are overwhelming LA just I mean maybe LA is the most intense but to ride down these roads with all this traffic and all these cars did you ever have any uh, uh, let's say doubt of your safety in that situation or did, could you move that aside and say no the bike gives me so much freedom it gives me 
um, you know, maybe a richer experience in my day-to-day -day going, I'm going to just stick to it. Yeah, luckily, Philadelphia has some great like infrastructure, yeah. bicycle infrastructure, even then, and now amazing um, that, or at least for American standards, uh, uh, they were amazing that yeah. it was easier. And I'm so happy that it happened in a city like Philadelphia, yeah. where I was. It was easy for me to to travel by bike within the city limit. And I started saving money for me to travel and, right. uh, because I didn't have to pay maintenance of vehicle, insurance, gas, all that stuff that I'm like, oh, this makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. To just commute by bike yeah. and that's, yeah. Was, was that also the moment then that traveling and the bicycle sort of clicked? No, years and years later, after 10 years or so, I went back to Miami where I grew up and I was competing uh, triathlon because I was a runner and I've been a swimmer most of my life uh, since early on I was swimming in clubs so and now that I picked up the bike I'm like oh maybe I could combine all three sports and I'll do some small triathlons right yeah. um, and and I competed and I loved it but my hair <laughs> got <laughs> got longer and longer and it will get wet and 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 it will like it will be hard to swim you know so uh, not only because of that but also like i mentioned earlier i'm very curious and and competing just it, within the city limits that i'm used to didn't fill my soul or that spirit that i have of traveling right so one day i decided i'm gonna go from miami to key west which is roughly about 155 miles. I didn't know anything about traveling my bike. I just said, I'm just gonna go. I wish, and this is common sense, right? But I didn't, I didn't use my common sense. I just did it in one day. I went 155 miles one way, and the following day, I went 155 miles back. Um, so I was, I was done. I loved it, but I was like, next time I have to do it. And, uh, in different days, right? Yeah. Maybe four yeah, yeah, days yeah, yeah. instead of yeah. two days, right? But I also was limited because of my work. I only had the two days off and that's why I did it as well. But on that trip, I fell in love with traveling by bike, being able to stop at restaurants, being able to stop at cafes, engaging with people, engaging with the landscape. And uh, it's just so beautiful. Till this day, that's one of my favorite routes that I've done and I've done some amazing trips but that little short trip uh, goes through like the seven mile bridge right so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the seven mile bridge but Miami to Key West is just little islands that are connected with bridges which is amazing so you are always surrounded by the ocean and there is one um, bridge it's called seven mile bridge and there's nothing but water on the right and water on the left for seven miles and it's a low bridge and you just feel like you're floating on the water. It's such an amazing feeling that I just like fell in love with traveling by bike and then that was back in 2009 and and after that I just like this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I just want to I want to see the landscape of this country. As you know like when you travel by bike I don't listen to music, I'm just listening to my thoughts and I'm getting some all kinds of thoughts and I'm like, I wonder if I could see this whole country by bike. It's such a, it's such a, a reminder to my first trip. Everything you're telling me, it's exactly what I was living in, in my trip from, from New York to Los Angeles. The first ever bike packing trip, I guess bike touring trip I did. I had a big backpack, a really bad bike, but I just wanted to, I, I wanted to get to Los Angeles. I'd been there with my parents on a, on a holiday many years back. And in 2014, I worked up the courage to go and do that project. And I was not prepared. I was cycling way too much distance in a day and, and cutting through some really beautiful stretches of this country. Um, namely, I always give the same example, which is I went through Flagstaff and 80 kilometers north, I guess 50 miles north is Grand Canyon, right. and the same distance to the south is Sedona. Just these beautiful rock formations, and I didn't see them because for me the goal was to get to the city. But on the way, I learned that the bike gave me this freedom of thinking, so to say, this, this lack of distractions. And namely, on a day in Kansas where I had 
maybe 12 hours on the bike and I was just cycling a straight road, fields around me, nothing to see, no distractions, maybe once every hour a truck would pass, but that would be it. And I just saw the whole day a storm forming in front of me, you know, slowly coming to fruition with thunder and all that stuff. And that day was incredible for me because I could just sink into my thoughts. Yes. So I, I totally know what you mean when you say that, mm. you know, you're over this bridge, water on both sides, and you're just going into your mind, digging into all the memories that you have and thinking of new things. And also, fall, from what it sounds like, falling in love with traveling by bike. Yes. So uh, I'm curious what the next step was for you, because if this is 29, uh, tw uh, 2009, you did your first uh, let's say big project where you pulled another subject into traveling by bike in 2014 am I not correct? Yes but in 2010 I decided from that trip that I took in Key, from Miami to Key West I started thinking hmm I wonder if I could go from border to border and um, I didn't know Again, I didn't know anything about traveling by bike. I didn't even know that there was a community of people that love traveling by bike. I just knew that I wanted to go from border to border. It's just like, it was an amazing goal. And for me, it wasn't that I was thinking of doing this to where I am today. It was just like, if I do this one trip, how cool, I wanted to do something epic for myself. I think I was in a space of my life where I needed to uh, create something but it had to be for me so uh, when i say create something like i just wanted to be by myself um but i wanted to be epic yeah i wanted i lost my mom at an early age my talking about my mom and how influential she was my mom passed away um when i was 19 years old it was in 1993 my mom passed away i was 19 years old freshman in college when she passed away she was 46 47 years old um, and that had a tremendous impact in my life because my mom loved traveling too, right? And she was full of life. And then for all of a sudden, for her to pass and transition and that, that was like, wow, life is so fragile. Yeah. And if I, I have to learn from her passing and the lessons that I got was to live. Right. Because at that point, I was just working, 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 like trying to climb this ladder of career. Right. Like and I just like, stop. Let me just take some time for myself. And that's when I said, I don't care what that looks like. I didn't know if it was going to go from south to north, north to south. I just want to go from border to border. Yeah. It just it just it was um, it was uh, uh, what can I say? It's epic. Right. If you look at going from Canada to Mexico instead of going on a on a trip that I went from Miami to Key West I wanted to be longer yeah and if that was the last trip that I've ever done that would have been pretty epic and it's something that I could share for the rest of my life but after that I wanted to see more yeah after that trip but that was in 2010 from 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 Vancouver Canada to Tijuana Mexico along nice. the Pacific Coast along Highway. the coast yeah. you did it the right way we we went up the other way mm -hmm. and we had headwinds all the yeah. time yeah. <laughs> you could see the the coast there it's yeah. a beautiful stretch oh it's amazing was it uh, in any way transformative for you that trip was it did it did it give you that feeling of like proving something to yourself that you were able to do a big project like that going border to border you know like um like i mentioned for me it was something to when i get older i said i did something amazing right and i could share with uh, my son or if i had a wife and things like that that i did i was not married or i didn't have a kid back then but uh, something i could pass down right that i had this memory yeah. that i did for myself yeah. but i got more than than that I got um, got to learn a lot about myself um, got to learn a lot about people got to learn a lot about the landscape of the country uh, but but mainly got to learn a lot about myself you know and and you know traveling by bike it's very physical it's not just pictures and and and, and beautiful sceneries and and good food uh, but it's physical yeah and, and then there's ups and downs, right? Like kind of like uh, on my social media, I use the, 
the metaphor that um, I used, uh, what's that word that I'm looking for? I used the significance um, and the similarities is what I'm looking for. I, I look for the similarities that, that I learned traveling by bike and uh, on my regular life, right? So you, I always talk about the ups and down of, of a trip, but life is like that, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I got to learn how strong I was, man. Like going through, you know, Miami is pretty flat, but then I'm climbing the elevation of uh, north um, of Washington and Oregon and California, which is like big climb oh, for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I uh, got to learn how strong I was, and 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 yeah, I I love taking the time for myself, and and I wanted to see more. I yeah. wanted to see more, not only physically, but wanted to see more of my insight. You know, the first day for most people. Almost every cyclist that we spoke to in the past few years has a first day story of a long trip. It's always the most impactful day in a way. It, it seems to be like that because it's the day that you put yourself out into the world. It's the day that you start the project, that there's all this load on your shoulders because you've told a bunch of people, you made the promise to yourself, and then you're there on the bike using your legs to move yourself forward and then a storm hits or something goes wrong or whatever and your spirits get low. Um, did you have a very powerful first day experience mm -hmm. on that trip? I don't know if it was the first day, but definitely the third day uh, was impactful. Something that um, has impacted me all these years. Uh, on the third day, well, I did have something I want to share. On the first day, I did realize something that there was big elevation mm. and I remember getting on my first climb and I was like, oh my God, I can't do this. And um, I was going to get off the bike and something told me, don't get off the bike, stay on the bike because if you get off the bike, you're going to train your mind to get off the bike every time you see a, a, a hill that I'm not used to climbing, you know? Again, Miami's flat where I grew up, so everything was very challenging. So I decided to stay on the bike and I'm so glad that I did because it's something that I carry on all my trips. Like, I don't care how slow I go, I'm staying on my bike. Yeah. And that has helped me uh, mentally to get stronger and stronger. And uh, so that's that. But on the third day, I approached Port Townsend, Washington. And I remember going into a bike shop because I, I, I wanted to make sure that I was going the right way. Even though it's north and south, you think it's easier, but when you get into little towns like where you're staying at a hostel or a campsite and you're like, okay, how do I get to that street? That's where I was in a situation where I didn't know what the 101 was to get down south. And I stopped at a bike shop and the guy was like, he was just opening, his name is Bob Sean. And Bob Sean was like, dude, this bike is heavy. Mm. He said, I've seen people come through because it's in on the route of, uh, the Pacific Coast Highway. Yeah. And he said, I've seen many travelers and this is pretty heavy. So he said, I have just met him 10, 15 minutes, right? And all of a sudden I said, he says to me, I'm gonna put everything on the floor that you need to ship home. And I'm gonna put everything back that I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> like I just met you, dude. Like you can't put my stuff on. But I'm like, okay. He knows more than me because he has a bike shop and also he's seen travelers come through, you know? So I, uh, I trusted him and he was like, why are you carrying three books? Like, like that's a lot of weight, you know? And, and you're gonna be so tired that uh, you're probably not gonna read all these books. And uh, how come you have this pair of jeans? Like, honestly, you have these shorts that this will be enough to when you travel. And, and I'm like, oh, when I have, you know, when I go to towns, so I wanna wear my jeans, it's like, no, nah, it's not gonna be like that. This is how it is when you travel by bike. And I'm so glad that I listened to him because I went from almost like 70 pounds to like 35, 38 pounds, you know? Wow. Literally over um, almost 30 pounds yeah. that I was shipping back home. Yeah, almost half of your entire And trip. it saved my trip. Not only my trip, but I enjoyed it 
uh, I enjoyed it better, right? Imagine carrying 70 pounds through those elevations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and now, I'm, not that I'm flying through, but I'm a little lighter. Yeah. And uh, until this day, we have been friends and we text each other almost almost on a daily basis. But, nice, nice. Yeah. I love that. I wish I would have had a bob on my yeah, first trip yeah. because like I said, I had a backpack and I was carrying a, a big glass water bottle because I thought it was cool. I was wearing a fake leather jacket because I thought it was cool and mm -hmm. I had a an extension strip for like for the plugs that you put in the wall the european ones so yeah. i wouldn't have to oh, carry geez. adapters or something it was so heavy and yeah. people were telling me the same thing i didn't listen i was very yeah. stubborn but yeah i i can relate with yeah. what it's like to send home things and then get lighter along the way make better gear choices we've had so many years of that doing that that at some point you also arrive at a, a bit of a compromise with yourself because some things you need Correct. They're not necessary for everyone. Like we have our filming kit and we take that along and it's big weight, but it adds so much to our trip. Do you have any highly personal item that you always take with you that mm. is perhaps not necessary? Mm. Um, to me, uh, it's photos of loved ones. Uh, I carry every time, uh, especially after that first trip, I, I was trying to document. I didn't know anything about documentation and stuff, but I had a GoPro and I wanted to share it with my family and my friends some of my experiences. And I remember going down the hill and I'm like, oh, they have to see how cool this hill is. And you know, sometimes when we document, we document the safe things because uh, you're trying to survive, right? Yeah. And it's just safe to not take a camera. And what I did was I was taking a camera down a big, downhill on the Pacific Coast Highway and I was filming the background and I'm going like maybe 50 miles an hour and you could see like my hair going back and my face going like this and I remember going home and I shared that to my dad my dad's like don't ever do that again um, and 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 I remember that what that impactful what my dad says and you know how nervous is he was that after the next trip, I will always take a picture of my family, my dad, my mom, you know, some loved ones yeah. uh, with me to remind me that I have loved ones waiting for me at home and to be more responsible. So yeah. now for all these years, I always take a picture. Now take a picture of my wife, my son, and, and it's just that, that I have to be responsible and that I have some loved ones waiting for me at home. Yeah. And the benefit is that it's nice and light. <laughs> I was going to say that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, the following trip from Vancouver to Tijuana, the following trip was from Miami to New York City. Right. And on that trip, there was a lot of historical uh, places that I went to in northern Florida, um, in Georgia and South Carolina. I started seeing what in the U.S. we call we had a, a civil war. Um, um, and, and I was going through Civil War uh, places, right? And I'm like, oh man, this happened here in South Carolina and North Carolina, and then uh, going into Virginia and then uh, DC who has, um, DC, there's a lot of museums and things like that where I've been a fan of history for, since I was a kid. So I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I'm going through like, it was almost like reading books, right? But just traveling, it was just so fascinating. And I, you know, I was in, in Delaware and then into New Jersey and then into New York. And I got to learn pieces of history of those um, in that route. And then I said, wow, why don't I combine history with traveling by bike? Because it's what I love the most right now, right? History and traveling by bike. But I also understood that on that other trip, going from, from Canada to Mexico, it was very physical to me, right? The challenging of the elevation, that I'm like, if I could combine something with a purpose that will allow me to be excited about the next town or the next city that I'm going to, it's almost like putting that carrot, right? And that would, that's what does to me, traveling through history does. I don't care how demanding, it is physically, I know that I want to get to the next town because I'm going to learn this or I'm going to see this. And that's when it clicked. I'm like, I'm just going to travel through history. 
And then after that trip from Miami to New York City, I started looking at different projects that I was interested in. And one of the ones that I've always been interested in is the, the Underground Railroad and the resilient of those people. And, you know, as human beings, we know what freedom is. Everyone from, from Tokyo to Israel to Brazil to the Netherlands, everyone knows what freedom is. That is one thing as human beings, regardless of how we speak and how we look, we know the significance of freedom. And for me, that trip, um, I wanted to learn more about the, the struggle of the Underground Railroad. And I knew a little bit about it through uh, educating myself uh, in books in high school and college, but, but to emerge yourself into the history and that era yeah. Yeah, that and, was very impactful. And the, the, the Underground Railroad route then, um, from what I've, I've learned about it, is that it was a, not, a, not a set route, it was a, a, a combination of routes that led up to Canada from the from southern US. I don't know Correct. exactly which state, but it... All the southern, all all the the southern, southern states. Yeah. So it, it basically like veins of... of, of um, freedom seekers so to say yes. up to up to canada helping each other to try and get there which i mean if i say it it sounds completely dystopian it's a bit you know and there are series that, that touch on this kind of subject in a, in a modern way but the fact that you you have to go through something like that must have been grueling in the first place but the 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 main the core of the underground railroad is that it's a collection of route which slaves took from southern states in the u.s up to canada to seek freedom and to Correct. to undo themselves of their Correct. Uh, of bondage. Their, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I like the word that you use, freedom seekers, because uh, once they left those plantations, that's who they were. They yeah. were freedom seekers, and that's the word that I use uh, as well. Um, and it's exactly what you say. It was a network of businesses, houses, people, other people uh, that help uh, the freedom seekers escape up there. Yeah. So it was called the Underground Railroad, but it wasn't a railroad that was underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some people don't know yeah. that, but it was just a <laughs> network of of that of houses, businesses that allow people to to hide, to shelter, uh, yeah. to shelter uh, and to travel into freedom, which it was Canada. Many fleeing enslaved crossed the Ohio River from Louisville, Kentucky, to New Albany, Indiana. When I crossed the Second Street Bridge from Louisville, Kentucky, into Indiana. I was taking a picture of a historical market in New Albany, which was located next to the Second Baptist Church. The service laid out, and I was introduced to Pastor Reverend Leroy Marshall, who took me to a trap door down the basement and showed me secret rooms, doors, and tunnels where previous freedom seekers were kept for safety and medical care accessible through tunnels connected to a Union Army hospital. Because everything was related to the railroad, the, they called the guides uh, conductors. So the conductors at that time only knew a segment of, and sometimes only like two pieces of the segment of that of the, of the trip. Yeah. That way, it wasn't jeopardized. You right. see what it I'm was, saying? Like if you knew yeah, the yeah, whole yeah. way, you yeah. could jeopardize the system yeah. or the network. So they only knew of pieces, right? Um, and it was amazing. And when I traveled through through history. I want to experience. I'm not, I'm not going to go from point A to point B and just ride it. It's very important for me to, to research. It's very important for me to find places that were called underground railroad stations because they were called underground railroad stations. I wanted to, one of my goals when I travel is like, I want to spend the night with these freedom seekers or the freedom fighters. They, they spend the night. Yeah. I want to know where they went, you know? I want to travel that they travel. Yeah. And, and it's very important for me to do that. So I engage myself in the history uh, very much so. As a matter of fact, they travel at night because it was the safest way to travel of because course, in the daytime the people see you. Yeah. And um, I decided to travel three to four nights on that trip that wow. I did. It took me 32 days, uh, the whole trip. So I, tore, I chose four segments, four days where I travel at night, meaning I will wake up at 10 o'clock at night, break my camp, and I will travel in the middle of the night 
just because I wanted to engage myself. I wanted to know what it feels like to be afraid of traveling mm. at night. Yeah. And I was so afraid because I'm in places that I don't know. I can't see much, you know, and I don't know how what people are going to do to me, you know. So but that's what they felt like, you know, so. No, and they, they, they had to, in fact, and uh, I think it's really good that you decided to, to immerse yourself in that feeling. Because I, I mean, th uh, coming from a European perspective, obviously we have the, the Second World War history, uh, the Jewish population, and it's almost relatable in a sense because they also had to go underground, they also had to hide away. Um, from the people that were out to get them and I don't think modern people can very much relate with the feelings that they must have felt mm. but the fact that you then you know retrace that route and try to immerse yourself in those feelings I think that's very brave because it mustn't have been easy on you to try and really connect with those feelings of fear and and you know a lack of safety um, uh, the feeling of, of maybe being hunted in a sense Correct. and and having to shelter yourself away from from all that so uh, what was that like for you emotionally doing that trip well you you get connected um to those freedom seekers because you 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 see the landscape you're like look i by no mean ha could uh, compare my journey with their journey because yeah uh, I'm a free man, yeah. uh, also traveling by bicycle, where yeah. they were traveling by foot, and sometimes on a carriage, but um, for the most part, they had to go through swamp waters where I was on the road, right? So, um, so you can't compare that, but you could, would, and I, by no means I wanted to compare, but I wanted to see the landscape that they travel, and I got to see the swamp waters. I'm like, wow, look at that. Um, one of the things that I have to tell you is, and you mentioned it, that the Underground Railroad was a, a combination of different routes that will take you to freedom uh, into Canada. I follow an old, uh, we, we call it spiritual song, but it was a slave song that um, they will sing in plantations. Yeah. It's called Follow the Drinking Gourd, yeah. which you could actually listen to it if you go to YouTube, Follow yeah. the Drinking Gourd. Follow the Drinking Gore was a song, but what people didn't understand it was, is it was a modern GPS. It told other people that were singing it how to escape to Canada. Because he talks about following the, the Tennessee River to the Ohio River and the Big Dipper, which is the North Star. And I follow that particular route. I wanted to follow, like I mentioned to you, when I do my research in historical routes, I want to follow a historical route, not just like I'm going to go from this point to that point. So I went, follow that drinking gourd, and most of the time I was uh, camping on the banks of the river. Uh, the Tennessee River, the Ohio River, and there was a couple of times that, to answer your question, there was a couple of times that I woke up in the middle of the night, and I'm sure that has happened to you, and then you're like, I don't have any food. I, I run out of food, and then mosquitoes were biting me and killing me, and I was like, oh my God, this is so, right? Who wants this? So I'm getting bit by mosquito because I'm on the banks of the river and I'm also hungry. And then at that point I realized this is what they had to go through too, right? They had to go through hunger. They had to go through like mosquito biting them. They had to go through all these challenges, right? Yeah. So if I want to engage on, in history, this is what they went through. Yeah. And um, so I, they were always in back of my head, you know, like, they went through this and I'm going through this because I'm paying homage to them. At no point I'm going to be like, I'm going to go home because I'm uh, either outside my comfort zone or I feel discomfort, right? Yeah. Um, I, I love this way of traveling. For me, it works just because I love history and, um, and I love traveling by bike. So I get to learn a lot, you know. There was many places where 
There was one instance that I went to, um, there was a, a historical marker and it talks about the Underground Railroad. This happened in New Albany, Indiana, just over the bridge uh, from Louisville, Kentucky. And I wanted to take a picture of that historical marker. And, and when I got there, I was trying to take the selfie and the church let out. It, it's so beautiful to travel through history because things happen that you're like, how'd this happen? But I know how that happened because when I go out, I put the intention that I want to have experience and I want to learn more. The church let out. If I would have gone there on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or any other day other than Sunday, I probably would not have had the experience that I'm about to tell you. But one guy came out and said, hey, what are you up to? And I'm like, uh, I want to take this picture. I'm traveling from New Orleans to Canada, retracing the route of the Underground Railroad. And he was like, do you know this church was part of the Underground Railroad? And I'm like, no, I just want to take a picture of this. Can you take a picture for me? And he took the pictures like, let's go inside. And when I went inside, just to tell you a long story short, I got to go to the basement of this church that had tunnels. One that was connecting to a hospital where an army hospital where the nurses will come down and help the freedom seekers with, you know, any health issues. And another tunnel that will go into the into the town where these freedom seekers could go in with regular clothes and be part of the population and there was a bunch of rooms and I was like wow and that's why it was called the Underground Railroad because people above this church did not know that all this stuff was happening you know yeah. and this church was right on the river on the banks of the river um, you could see Kentucky on the other side and they used to take a boat or swim that river and there was a door that they would come in not the main door of the church but a, a small door uh, behind the church where people the freedom seekers were coming and I got to see all that and I'm like wow this is amazing you know <laughs> you you did this uh, trip not only once you did it twice actually yeah. right you did yeah. it, you repeated it in 2020 20. Okay, so besides the repercussions of 2020, the, the fact that you, you did this twice um, must mean that it, it meant a lot to you, the project. Yeah. Was there any practical reason to doing it twice? Did you miss things on the first time that you wanted to, mm -hmm. uh, to find out about on the second time? Yeah, for the most part, I tried not to do a trip twice because there's so many trips that I want to do that I'm like, I have to do other trips. And I remember finishing that trip on 2014, I'm like, I'm never going to do this again. Yeah. You know, as beautiful it is that as I'm telling you, I learned all this experience. Um, physically, it's hard uh, and spiritually, it's hard to learn the suffering of these people, right? So you're like, I'm done. <laughs> I learned a lot. And, um, but a few years later, I started thinking about the Underground Railroad again. And that's why I went back. But as you know, as a bicycle traveler, um, you could travel a long distance on a bike, but there's so much history of the Underground Railroad, especially Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, that area there. There's so much his physical history of the Underground Railroad that you can't go everywhere by bike. You know, it will, like if you go 100 miles one way, now you're out of the route, yeah. and then you got to come back 100 miles to get back on the route. Yeah, you would have to so, zigzag your way through. So literally, I'm like, I gotta go back again. I missed several things. And I probably will travel the Underground Railroad for the rest of my life because there's a lot of places I have not seen and I have to go back. Even though in 2020, I said the same thing. I'm like, I'm not gonna do this again, <laughs> but I'm already, now it's 2023 and I'm like, I gotta get back up there. Right. I really like the Underground Railroad, seeing the historical uh, uh, buildings, but I've just have so much respect on the the resilient of, of of those people that travel the underground railroad man like it was it's really hard you know but yeah. to learn uh who they were as people and and why they did it it's just like uh yeah i love i love that route i will travel that route for the rest of my life i i really like that you use the word resilience and that you touch on you know these trips having taught you so much over the course of the of many years in fact i want to take it back a little bit to you and your personal um, story the personal side outside of the trips because in your life you've 
you've lived in in a few places. The most recent one is LA, the city we are in now. And there's a story connected to that too, which I, I want to delve into a little bit. Um, from, from what I've learned is that, and it's too bad that we could never visit, but you've had a, a, a cafe of your own yes. in Phoenix, yes. uh, the Bicycle Nomad Cafe. Uh, maybe first, you know, having said that name, we can touch upon Bicycle Nomad, um, your brand, and then we can go into uh, the reasons that that shop is no longer here and that you've moved on to LA and what you're doing here right now connected to bikepacking, but also other type of expeditions, adventures, and just, you know, the job that you're creating out of this for yourself. So can you tell us a bit about the, um, the cafe that you were running, how it was connected to bikepacking, to the community, how that was growing, um, and ultimately why you had to close it? Yeah. Um, so I lived a very nomadic lifestyle, and that's where the Bicycle Nomad came about, and just to touch briefly on the brand and why it got started in 2014 when I was about to do the Underground Railroad. Uh, prior to that, I never told anyone other than my dad that I was going on a trip. Yeah. So I don't like when people say, oh, that's so dangerous or this or that. And I don't like that kind of energy because then I become afraid, right? Where usually I'm not. But then when I start listening to people, I'm like, well, maybe it is dangerous, you know? So I just don't tell people, only my dad. But in 2014, when I started looking into traveling by, uh, through history, it was very important for me to tell some people and also because I needed to do research, uh, working with historians, I'm like, hey, I'm doing this trip. And a lot of people will be like, you shouldn't do that. That's very dangerous. Or as a person of color, um, traveling through the South might be very dangerous. And I'm like, so I started like, oh my God, this is, that could be it, right? I could, could be dangerous, but yeah. um, I didn't experience that. I experienced like the kindness of people. As you know, we don't travel by ourselves. We travel with uh, what we call trail angels that appear to take you to the next location, kind of similar to the Underground Railroad experience. So, um, I was like having all this wonderful experience of people like, hey, you're welcome to come and join us for dinner. Or can I pay for your camping um, fee? Or hey, try this um, local iced tea, different things like that. And I'm like, wow, I wish people knew what I was going through. You know, I wasn't documenting at the time. I was just traveling by myself and I'm like, I need to document this. I need to tell people the beauty of traveling by bike. How do I do that? And then I started thinking, maybe I create this where people started calling me nomad and I'm like, uh, bicycle nomad because I was always on the bike and nomadic that I just like, oh, I call myself bicycle nomad. And it wasn't about me, but it was to create a brand where people will be connected. And I also wanted to inspire other people to travel by bike because I wanted them to experience what I experienced, which is like, not just the physical, but the experience of engaging with, each, with, with other people and waking up in different places. And I'm like, I'm just gonna use social media to do that. And I started calling it Bicycle Nomad and that grew from there. Um, to answer your question about the coffee shop, um, I, I, took, I took a trip prior to the Underground Railroad, no, just after the Underground Railroad, like a month or two, I went to Puerto Rico to go around the island of Puerto Rico. And I went to a coffee shop and everyone knew everyone. Everyone knew it was in the countryside. Everyone knew everyone's drink, everybody's name. Every, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And the beauty of being nomadic is that you are waking up in different places all the time. But the beauty of having a community is that people know you and know what you like to drink and also call you by name where I didn't have a name when I travel around, right? No one knew who I was. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's, that's beautiful to have a community like that. So my mind started changing from being very nomadic and just like, I don't care, I just want to be everywhere to like, I kind of want to have my own community. And I didn't know what that was going to look like. 
and the opportunity came about to open this Bicycle Nomad Cafe inside uh, a bike shop called The Velo in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And they had just opened a few months and, and I got to um, uh, sublease a, a section of that building to create my, 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 my coffee shop. And it was an opportunity that landed in my lap. It could have happened anywhere in the country, but it happened in Phoenix, Arizona. And I just knew that a coffee shop attracts a community, right? Like, um, and, and, and also not just the local community, but because at that point I have traveled several years by bike and some people have known me as the bicycle nomad. And there's a lot of sections and a lot of travelers that come through Phoenix. Tucson is a very popular location for bike packers yep. and, and Northern uh, Arizona as well. And, and people traveling through Mexico sometimes come through Phoenix. And um, so I just thought if we open this coffee shop, it will be a place where um, other bike packers and that community could come through and they have a space because at that, cof at, at that coffee shop, at the bike shop, there was showers and there was oh. places, there was Wi-Fi and, and uh, you couldn't spend the night there, but you yeah. could spend the whole day uh, either taking a shower, refreshing yourself and, and it became a popular uh, landmark. And I think going back, I was like, how do I market this place so other people know the Bicycle Nomad is open for, for everyone, especially bike packers to come through. And so I remember the first person that was coming through with all their bags and all that. I said, like, oh, can I take a picture of you? And then I said, oh, perfect. What I'll do is I'll take a picture of everyone that is coming through here and tell their story through uh, my Instagram. So everyone that came through, regardless if they were going in the U.S. or uh, traveling around the world, which we have people from all over, from China, from Germany, from from you know Amsterdam, from everywhere they came through there, um, I would tell their story uh, and put their put their Instagram. And I remember after I did that several times, people were like I would get DMs like, "Hey, I'm coming through. I would love to meet you and also take a picture that that famous picture at, inside the Bicycle Nomad." So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it became a thing, and I, I really love that I had that experience to own in that place. I love what you said earlier about the community, that you create a community by opening the very place that attracts it. Because it's something that Belen and I, we discuss it from time to time. We have a bunch of friends within the bikepacking community, and they're all fairly nomadic like us. Um, there's, uh, there's multiple that don't own a home, that are always on the go. And just recently, uh, a good friend of mine, Evan, he, he told me that he feels the lack of community very much in this moment. And, you know, how you have it in a city where you might be, I don't know, strolling through the streets of Milan, you'll see, um, you know, rock-built tables with, with chess boards on them. And the elderly uh, of Milan, they, they just come there to hang out on the weekend okay. and they play chess with each other. Yeah. And they, they do this, um, uh, I only know the French word, this jeu de boule kind of game with balls down a track. Uh, they speak with each other, they maybe go grab a coffee or something like that. And that, that, that very close kind of trusted community feeling is something you can really miss on the bike. Yeah. So the fact that you turned that into your shop, you took the risk of running a business and yes. you know, all that comes with that uh, and created that for other people must have, been, must have felt really rewarding, especially with so many people coming through and sending you uh, messages to, to make sure they get you and they get that picture. Um, yeah, I had a community on social media of bike packers and people traveling by bike and also my local Phoenix community. So, yeah, uh, yeah it, was, it, it was beautiful and I, and I missed that space. It was also just the start, really, of bikepacking routes, no? Because, I mean, we all know bikepacking.com and the route map they have. Um, now there's a bunch of other players with, with routes to offer to people that want to travel by bike. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Fool's Loop when like was the start and the finish in the in the actual coffee shop yes um so that must have added even more enthusiasm to to having something like that because you're fostering not only a, a, a little community of, of cyclists and locals 
but you're also involved in routes, which I think, to a certain extent, helps um, you know villages come back to life. Because cyclists are coming through and someone says, oh, okay, because cyclists are coming through, I'm going to start a cafe or I'm going to start a little hotel, hostel, whatever. Yeah. Um, the other side of the coin is, of course, you had to close it because of the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, it was a business after all, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that it must have been hard for you to go through the pandemic, the shutdowns, you know, suddenly no one showing up anymore and world travel being so prohibited for a lot of people. Was the closing process very straightforward or did you did you try running it a little bit after sort of things cooled down uh, pandemic wise? I, uh, you know, it happened, the decision was almost made for me because when I say that is that the pandemic happened. But prior to the pandemic happening, a month prior to that, literally a month prior to that, I, I married my wife. So February 20th of 2020, I married. Pandemic hit March 15 or in that time. Yeah. So a month later, now I have to close my coffee shop. So that was the first challenge. Now I'm, a, I'm somebody's husband and I can't provide. And um, that was nerve wracking. Um, then um, the owner, not, the owner of the building where the coffee shop was and the bicycle, the bicycle shop was, he decided to raise the rent in the middle of the pandemic. He decided to raise the rent because after five years of being there, there's a new lease that was coming. Yeah. And the owner of the bike shop was like, I can't pay that or I don't want to pay that. Uh, he probably could have, but he decided also it's the pandemic time yeah. and it's uncertain. So he said, Eric, I'm going to move to a, uh, we found a different location, a, sm uh, a smaller location, and we're going to go there. The location, unfortunately, is so small that we can't put a coffee shop there. And I said, okay, at that point, I had to make the decision. Do I look for another place, which I thought about it for a little bit, and or I just close the business and start another chapter of my life. Yeah. And, and again, uh, I just got married. Now having to close this location, I'm like, I had, I had to produce. Uh, to make sure that that you know we had a way to make a living, so I had to kind of pivot. Yeah. Um, Would you say it's it's that was the moment when you doubled down on making traveling by bike some kind of a job, some kind of a living for you, your wife, and I think that it, I think it was that time when I realized I had to pivot. Uh, luckily for me, I've already had like ten years of being kind of like a. a a social media persona, yeah. uh, not making a living, just a social media persona that I use that name to create a coffee shop. That coffee shop actually elevated my brand um, that in 2020 is when I received a call from one of my uh, sponsors, uh, who's a current sponsor, and he was like, we want to work with you. And I'm like, oh, okay, maybe there's, there's something here that brands now want to work with me that uh, I could potentially make a living out of it. And that's exactly when I was like, I need a pivot, right? Which is what we do as explorers. We have to adapt. Yeah, it's very so, important to, to yeah. adapt and especially in that time. Yes. I feel like the pandemic was a good time for, for the cycling industry. A lot of brands realize that there's a lot of people that want to go out and cycle and when you're at the front, forefront of, let's say, the inspiration to go out, and you've done so much to show people that it's possible to do all kinds of different trips, because by this time you have quite a track record of, mm -hmm. of rides, um, then why not take the chance? Correct. Just to jump ahead a little bit again, between 2020 and 2022, you went into the preparation of a, a new trip, something that has become quite attached to who you are and has been, you know, not only a passion, but also a bit of a responsibility for you. Something that you, you took up, um, which is the, the project surrounding the Buffalo Soldiers. Do you want to tell us more about that? Sure. Um, about 10 years ago when I started, well, I started traveling in 2009, but about 10 years ago, I came across 
well, I had this idea, right? I'm like, I'm always looking at the history of things, right? And I wanted to know who were the first people that traveled by bike? Where did they go? And why did they go, right? I started thinking like that. And so I started doing research and found a lot of trips that were taken in the late 1890s, between 1890 to 1899, I found a, a bunch of trips in Europe and the US. And I became fascinated, I was like, oh, look at these bikes, look at these people, and I love what they were wearing and, and, and just the photos. And then I came across the Bicycle Corps, which is the Buffalo Soldiers, and there were black men on bikes. So as a person of color, I became fascinated because up to that point, I didn't see anyone that looked like me on bikes, traveling by bike in the 1890s. And I'm like, man, look at this. This is amazing. It was almost like finding gold. That's how excited I was. I'm like, I've never seen this. And how come I didn't learn about this? And I felt cheated because um, I started traveling in 2009, but if I would have learned about these guys, I probably would have learned and I probably would have been motivated to travel a long time ago. Yeah. Remember, if, it was, if I learned in college, I, I lived on a beautiful route. I went to school in Daytona Beach and I lived in Miami. Around the coast of Florida would have been an amazing way to travel back home instead of like driving or flying. I would have, and I felt cheated, man. I was like, Dude, I wish I would have known about these guys. And that's the importance of, of representation, what we call representation, meaning like if you don't see yourself doing something like in a marketing of, of magazines or books, you're like, maybe I'm not welcome, right? But when you see guys that look like you and they were doing this in 1896, you're like, dude, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so. I don't want my son to have that kind of feeling, right? So, or other people's son that look like me. So I'm like, man, I'm gonna learn everything about these guys. And, and, and it became personal because I learned that uh, later on that we didn't know, now I know everybody's by name. I know every single person where they were born, where they passed away, but I can't put their faces with the name. You know what I mean? Like, who is this guy? And what this name, I didn't know that. And I'm like, man, if this was my grandfather or this was my great grandfather, I want the world to know how cool my grandfather was, right? Mm -hmm. I want everyone to know. Yeah. So that, that's who they became. They became like my grandfather, my great grandfather. They became relatives to me. And that's why it's so, it's so, personal to me this project you know before I do a trip a historical trip I like to connect with the people in the history uh, the people in the story so I wanted to tell them to guide me through the routes that they took um, for me ancestors are powerful so I was telling them private John Finley private John Wilson Mingo Sanders please guide me through the same routes that you guys took so protect me and it was just giving me a little safety before i left you know well it goes back almost 130 30 years the fact that you even try to dig up the personal details of these guys is already incredible to me but then also the fact that you you went out by bike and once again retraced something that has happened in history and tried to immerse yourself in that project in their mindset in the history of what they were attempting, which I think, if I'm correct, is is the bike a good tool to replace horses in the army, right? That was yeah, the, and, the main and it wasn't to replace the horses, but yeah, you're right. They wanted to test, it was an experiment to see if they could use the bicycle as a method of transportation. Yeah. Now the horse, you can't replace the horse, and they, they knew that. <laughs> yeah. But what they knew also was that the bike was cheaper than maintaining a horse. And that the bike could go a little further than the horse can. And that the bike was more quiet yeah. in battlefields. So they knew that they both 
could work really hand uh, with each other. So yeah. And that's why they did uh, the, the first expedition. No? The to, first to expedition, yeah, the first Which expedition. Which was 1900 miles and, or something like this, so well, they didn't take it lightly. They yeah, no, no. So they actually did three expeditions. Uh, the first expedition was in uh, 1896. Yeah. And they went from uh, Missoula, Montana to Lake McDonald's. It was about 150 miles each way. Okay. So 300 miles round trip. That was the first test. But you have to understand, these are single speed bikes, yeah. no gear. Another thing that a lot of people did not know is that only like a few of them knew how to ride a bike. Right. So they had to learn pretty fast. Yeah. Um, and these are adults. They're 23, 26 years old. They didn't know how to ride bikes. Uh, following that expedition, it was so successful that they were like, let's go a little further. So they went from Fort Missoula uh, in Montana to Yellowstone. Roughly, it's about 600 miles round trip, but inside the, the park, the Yellowstone, mm -hmm. they did about 200 miles of traveling. Okay. So totally was close to 800 miles. Wow. And the one that I did last year, 125 years after the original ride, was uh, from Fort Missoula, Montana to St. Louis, Missouri, 1,900 miles, 41 days. And it was like to test. They wanted to go further and further. But when you're traveling in Montana, for the most part, the temperature, the weather, the terrain, it's about the same. Yeah. So they knew they had to go further. And that's why they created Montana to St. Louis because uh, it gave them diversity in, in the route, in the weather, the elevation, rain. Yeah. the rain, the food. I mean, it's just Thank you everyone for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Finally here. 125 years in the making. Buffalo Soldiers retracing history. The first, um, the first expedition you've done, the 1900 mile one, you, I think you've given the name Truth and Dignity yes. to it. Yes. Can you tell me why you chose that name? I think it's a beautiful name and I think I know what it means, but can you tell me? Well, I felt like I didn't learn about these guys, right? And a lot of people have not. So that meant they have not been celebrated. And for me, for you, for anybody that traveled by bike, they should be celebrated because they're pioneers. These were the original, what I hashtag them, the original bike packers because, uh, because what they went through, right? And I'm like, how come it's not celebrated by our cycling industry, our bikepacking industry, and how come it's not taught in school? And so I'm like, you know what? I want to give them dignity. Uh, also, I mentioned to you, uh, when I first started, I didn't know faces with name. Yeah. Uh, three years ago, I started working with historians where now we're able to name eight of them with face and name. They have 12 of them. I don't know who they are. I have names, but I can't put it with face yet. Yeah. Some of them were buried without uh, a grave marker. So recently we were able to put a grave marker at the mechanic of the expedition, Private John Finley, who's buried in Chicago. And we, 10 months ago, we put a, a, a grave marker. Uh, for me, it's very important. These are my heroes, you know, that they have to be recognized. And um, so I understood that the dignity had to be given to them because it wasn't given to them while they were alive. Yeah. And I wanted to tell their truth. I wanted to tell the truth of what happened to these guys and who these guys are, you know. So that's why I named it Truth and Dignity. Wow. It was very emotional to be on the same route of these guys that have been doing research. And that's the beauty of traveling by bike. When, um, when some people are like, oh, can you share their route? And I'm like, you know, the beauty of traveling through history is doing the research because then you get connected yeah. with, those, with, with that era and what they went through. If you're just given the route, you're not connected per se, right? I mean. Uh, that's, that's, how, that's how I feel. So I feel very connected on a personal level because I've done so much research on them. 
and yeah that 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 was just the beauty of it but uh, to go to places where they stayed which is very important for me it's similar to the underground railroad i wanted to stay where they stayed if i could stay at two or three of the places that they stayed man that's a good feeling if i could eat where they ate that's a good feeling and that happened on both trips on the underground railroad and on the bicycle core the truth and dignity because I knew they stayed in a couple of military bases and I got to stay there, which is so interesting because now you know what happened and that they stay here. So as tired as I was, I couldn't go to sleep on both on the Underground Railroad. I, when I stayed at Underground Railroad Station, I couldn't sleep because I was like, man, so many people came through here, you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. similar to that, I was like, the guys were here. I, can't, I couldn't sleep. I was just so it was like caffeinated, you know. Mm, and that happens a lot and, and, and I had an instance where I stayed at Fort Harrison in Helena, Montana uh, just three days after I had started traveling and then I go to Big Timber, Montana and there was a tavern where there was a journal because they also had a, a journalist he was 19 years old uh, University of Montana student he was his name was Edward Booz and Edward was not military but he documented everything and I came across that documentation yeah. um, and when they went through Big Timber he uh, there was a, a retired soldier that was having a drink and he saw them coming in he saw the bicycle corps coming in on, on formation and invited everyone into the tavern mm. to have a drink he said i want everyone to have a drink and these guys had some highlights and some lowlights but i like to celebrate their highlights and and that they were invited to have a drink at a tavern i'm like i want to know where that tavern is or where the tavern was so, yeah i just wanted to be in that space did you manage to find it with the help of some historians, we recognize the, the tavern that it was, and it's still there. That place has been there since 1890. Wow. And I walked in and I just told the bartender and the manager, <laughs> I'm like, hey, I'm following this route, and these are the pictures of the historical route. And they were like, well, they got a free drink. You need a free drink. Yeah. And that was pretty cool to go to places where people didn't know that that happened. And, yeah. and, and, but they, they loved the, the story and they know it's, it's U.S. history. So uh, that was pretty cool. And your reenactment didn't, uh, didn't just stop there because you also you were documenting it uh, for social media. You did a few yeah. things on Instagram. One that stood out for me was the photo where you, you're posing in front of a row of buildings. Yes basically reenacting the exact same photo yes. that was taken 125 years ago by I guess the journalist yes um, I love that shot and the fact that you were able to track that down find the exact location frame the shot I have a lot of respect for that thank you yeah. as a photographer I, yeah. I could see that <laughs> and for me as a historian now I'm becoming a historian is that um, again I want those experience I want to be in the space that those freedom seekers or those freedom fighters were, right? Yeah. If I could be in that and feel that energy and what, if, if it looks the same or if it looks different. Yeah. So I was looking for an opportunity like that. So I have many photos from the 1896 and 1897 expedition. And, I, and, and that particular photo um, is one of my favorite photos. So mm. I'm so glad that it happened, but I knew that I wanted to have the opportunity to at least visit some of those places where they went to eat and stayed but also wanted to reenact um, and recreate it one of those those photos and i'm glad that it happened on this trip with yeah. that photo yeah overall do you do you feel like having done having undertaken their their third expedition and you having having finished this first project of the three that you're onto something bigger than what you initially thought you would find you know, the, for me, I could have taken this trip ago, like, I could have taken this trip 10 years ago, maybe six years ago, maybe three years ago. But I also knew that I wanted to give them, I wanted to tell the story completely. So I needed to learn more. So in reality, I couldn't do it 10 years ago, five years ago, or even three years ago, because I didn't know all the story mm -hmm. until recently where I'm like, I 
think I think I have everything. I think I have everything, and I'm sure that there's some uh, holes that I'm missing, but I have everything to give them the dignity and to tell the audience and other audiences that this is what they went through. I was stressing out, Tristan, because I wanted to make sure that I didn't leave anything on the table. Like, right. I wanted to tell everything. So that's why I documented, uh, if you follow my journey, every day I was documenting what happened in that particular town, in that particular, because I wanted people to learn. Yeah. You know, it, it's not my story, it's yeah, somebody's yeah. story, and, yeah. and I'm just the storyteller. Yeah. And I, and I, I yeah, they, I had to tell the, the, the way it was. Yeah, well, and, you're retelling it, so it's extremely important that you retell it. And I didn't know that it was gonna get to, to, to get this big, right? But uh, I'm so glad that people are, um, are still interested and are very supportive. And, and that's why I said last year, that I must continue to do more research on, on these guys uh, and knowing who they were as people. And also I wanna continue like the other explorations because they did those other two prior to doing the longer one. Yeah. And I had so much, um, it was such a beautiful experience to learn as a, every day that I, I, wanna, I, I, wanted, I wanna learn more. You know, and, and I want to go back this year and they started around August on the first expedition that was 300 miles and they did it in four days. Yeah. Imagine that, 300 miles in four days in a single speed. These guys were almost superhuman and that's, yeah. that's just the beauty of it that I'm like, they have to be celebrated. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, I, I can't wait what you're gonna, to see what you're going to make out of this and to see the project gradually come to completion. Um, maybe that's a good moment to to go from the past to the future. You know your plans, what you've laid out for yourself. I'm an avid follower of your work. Um, I'm pretty sure some of the people watching are too. And I'm just curious what things are in the pipeline for you besides the Buffalo Soldiers project. Are there any other things, bikepicking or not bikepicking related, that you have on your agenda and that are important for you to to share about? Yeah, like I mentioned early on, I've been curious since I was a kid and bikepacking has allowed me um, to have other opportunities, especially through Instagram where there's a community of other explorers that uh, might not be bikepackers but are following my adventures and I follow their adventures and, um, and now I'm communicating with other people where next, this upcoming Friday, I'm doing a polar training with um, a guy who is the only human being who's been to the North Pole, South Pole, and climbed Everest all in one year. And we have connected uh, for a couple years, and um, so I'm taking one of his course to potentially go to the North Pole. And I'm doing a polar training, nine days, um, uh, below anything that I've ever been. Right now, where we're going, it's about 15 degrees, uh, 15 below zero Fahrenheit wow. yeah. um, and that's outside my comfort zone but I'm open to experience just because I'm curious. I've also been invited to uh, do some scuba diving uh, expeditions and, and other opportunities are happening that even though I love traveling by bike, um, I want to have those experiences as well yeah. and, and I'm so glad that it's you know social media and bikepacking has opened those avenues for me. Do you have any tips or advice for people that want to do projects similar to yours, want to go down similar ways, seeking freedom, adding something valuable to the world, whether it's history or uh, exploration wise? Do you have any advice for those people that want to be a bit like you and do something like what you're doing right now? You know, um, uh, the passing of my mom taught me so much at an early age that I know that uh, life is beautiful and that you must do what you love right and learn and and experience everything that i do is from my heart um and i follow my spirit right so i i would say to people that would want to do what i do is just follow their spirit and the spirit will guide you what to do where to go and will connect you with the avenue to 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 do this for a living because 
Um, there's, n there's nothing better than uh, being happy with, with yourself, with, um, with what you're doing, because everyone, your community, your family, your spouses, the relationship that you have will benefit from you being happy. And I am happy today because I follow my spirit, you know, and he has guided me to where I am today. So I just say that. That's follow beautiful. your heart, follow your spirit, yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, to complement that question, maybe, because I'd, I'd love this answer, the, the experience on the bike, when you're, when you're out there in a natural environment, you know, getting dirty, being thirsty, being hungry, having to do things yourself, building up your tent, sleeping out in the wild with nobody around, do you have any maybe mindset advice for the kind of trips that you've undertaken, things that you have maybe clinged on to in moments that were really difficult for you? Hmm. Um, early on, as I've always, with experiences, I realized that bikepacking, which is what I know the most, um, will teach you lessons that you could carry on your personal life outside bikepacking. And they're very similar. And we talked about the ups and down of going up the mountain, down the mountain, which is similar to our life. So, you know, it's not always what Instagram shows, which I'm always showing <laughs> smiling and the bike. I have up and down, you know, it's similar to my trips, right? So um, there's a similarity uh, of, of traveling by bike and personal life. And I always thought, I always tell people and it's kind of like my mantra and my motto and what I live by. And I said that bikepacking will teach you many lessons. But one of them is you have to learn how to be comfortable outside your comfort zone. For you to enjoy, um, and I don't know if enjoy me because it's not always joyful, right, out yeah. there. But for you to, you have to be open. You have to be open and you have to understand that uh, it's when you understand that you're gonna be comfortable outside your comfort zone, it's when you start learning things and you're like, oh, that was pretty cool. It, even though sometimes it was a hard moment where you're camping at night and it's raining or whatever they may be, those experiences always stretches you and build character. So the next time that happens, you're like, oh yeah, I did that last year or two years ago. And I'm like, I know how to handle this rain or this storm or, or, or traveling at night where sometimes it could be very nerve wracking, right? Because you're in places where you don't know, but yeah. uh, experiences always will take you where to build character and the next time that happens, you're like, I've been there. You've been there, done that. I've been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> so I know how to, I, I know how to do this, you know? Yeah, and the um, most important thing is obviously to just do it and get that first time in so that you can know what you feel like in that situation. And no travel and no expedition or no uh, adventure is perfect. Right. Uh, you're just gonna learn and they shouldn't be. It's, the, the, the thing is just to go out and do it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I think that's very powerful and it's a beautiful ending to, <laughs> to our, our interview. Uh, we've gone so in depth. I'm, I'm stunned by everything that you've done, the way that you think about your projects. Can't wait to see what you're going to do next. And, yeah. Um, well, I just want to say thanks for letting us be part of your life for a, a little bit uh, and having us here for this conversation. Well, I'm a fan of what you guys do as well. So the, the feeling is mutual and I'm so glad that I got to meet you both because uh, I've been following, I, I love the work that you guys are putting out and, and, and you guys are ambassador to a lifestyle that I am um, so connected to. So thank you for the work that you guys do as well. Thank you, you're very welcome. <laughs> Hey, we're good, we're good. <laughs> nice. Wow, I hope that wasn't too intense for you. Nah. This was no, it's good. Quite it's, a deep dive. Yeah, it's deep dive, wow. definitely. Um, I've, and